hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast and I'm your host, Thomas Dinas. And I just want to apologize for uh, not being with you last week. Um, it has been a really, really busy week and I didn't have the chance to release part 5 of uh, the History of Wine. But I recorded a really interesting interview with a really special guest uh, for the podcast about a very hard but deliciously sweet and yet controversial subject. You'll find all about it, uh, I think, next week when we're going to release it. But yeah, let's go back to part five of the history of wine. And this time, let's move on in uh, the post-Roman uh, world, the Europe in the Middle Ages and uh, what um, what was happening then in our uh, wine adventure. But before we go to our uh, episode, let's hear a little bit from my friends, the Partial Historians, and their awesome and lovely podcast. Hello, hello, this is Dr. Rad. And this is Dr. G. And together, we're the co-hosts of The Partial Historians. We love ancient Rome and all the quirks that humanity has to offer. Our podcast combines analysis, discussion about sources, and a good dash of irreverence. As lovers of the delicious legacy, we know you have an appetite for the delights of the ancient world. Join us for our narrative episodes as we explore the history of Rome from the founding of the city. Or perhaps you'd like to drop by for our special episodes on topics such as historical films, ancient personalities, academic guests, and our never-ending fight about who was the better emperor, Augustus or Tiberius. It's Tiberius. It's definitely Augustus. <laughs> you can find The Partial Historians wherever you listen to quality podcasts, such as The Delicious Legacy. We're out and about on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And now, back to your regular program. By the first centuries of um, the Christian era, wine production has spread throughout much of Europe. So from uh, Crete in the south to England in the north and from Portugal in the west, all the way almost to Poland in the east. Wine was also in a very prominent cultural position at the time. With the adoption of Christianity as a state religion of the Roman Empire, the status of wine was put on an even firmer basis. So the association with uh, religious rituals had an impact generally. I mean, not only religiously, but also in the attitudes towards wine in, in a secular way. But also the expansion of wine and its popularity was not only because of this. As we know, it symbolized the blood of Christ, of course, but it was also a very prominent commercial product. And this can go a long way of explaining uh, the extension of vineyards and wine production in general. With the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire, um, of course, the Roman Empire did disappear overnight, but also the Roman Empire was still alive in the form of what we call nowadays the Byzantine Empire. And even though um, we lost a lot of uh, records about um, what happened in the west part, The Roman ruling classes in the East were terrible wine snobs. Not only did uh, they set themselves off from their social inferiors by the types of wine they drank and the circumstances in which they drank it, but they judged foreigners harshly because of the preferred alcoholic drinks and their alleged drinking habits. So the general rules applied by the Greek and Roman upper classes were that the peoples were uncivilized if they did not drink wine. If they drank wine but did so straight instead of diluting it with water, or if they drank it excessively, or whatever it was that they drink. So that much we know of uh, the ancient Greeks and Romans, their attitudes towards wine. And the Greeks um, of ancient and classical Greece, they regarded Scythians, Thracians as barbarians and civilized for these reasons. And the Romans pointed to the Germanic tribes uh, beyond the empire borders as barbaric 
for the same exact reasons, because they drank beer and not wine. Of course, all these are part of the prejudice uh, against, um, I guess, the northern uh, neighbours of Greeks and the uh, Romans, and not uh, much uh, <laughs> on the basis of reality. The invasion of uh, the Western Empire by these uh, Germanic tribes from the 5th century seemed to herald bad news for wine, right? Yet the barbarians lasted for wine, but lacked the discipline and the patience that was needed to produce it. But was it all the fault of the Germanic tribes? Or the, or the, the impact they had on the wine production? If there were adverse effects, it was unlikely to have been the direct result of willful neglect or deliberate damage to vineyards. And if the most negative portrayal of Germanic drinking habits were accurate, we should surely have expected the new arrivals to have promoted wine production rather than reduce it. Indeed, during the turmoil and sporadic invasions of Germanic tribes between the 3rd and the 5th centuries, viticulture in Europe not only flourished but continued to spread. It was in this period that vineyards were consolidated in many regions. Along the Mosel near Trier, for example, and in the valleys of the Seine, Yon and Loire rivers. Yet, the kinds of evidence we would like to have in order to confirm the vibrancy of wine production and trade are often missing. The replacement of amphoras by wooden barrels in the first century might have had advantages for shippers, but it was real disservice to future historians. As much as the evidence um, been sparse, they lead us to believe that there were continuities and even some regional growth in viticulture during these centuries. For one thing, the barbarians seem to have supported wine production. Visigothic law codes, for example, set out severe punishments for anyone found guilty of damaging vineyards. In Portugal, the Gothic king Ordono, who ruled from 850 AD, granted vineyards near Coimbra to monastic order. Such examples suggest that the rulers who replaced the Romans took care to protect vineyards and that rather than the monasteries protecting wine production from the barbarians, the barbarians actually increased the church's holdings. In Saxon England, there were many signs of a positive view of wine, but an ambiguous evidence of vineyards is rare, and the best evidence of English vineyards derives from the late 11th century when many vineyards were planted by the conquering Normans. Some relatively secure evidence of English uh, vineyards are coming from the 10th century, from Alfred's great-grandson, King Edwig, who granted vineyards in Somerset to the monks of Glastonbury Abbey in 956, and King Edgar gave vineyards and its vine growers to Abington Abbey. The fact that there were any vineyards at all at least opens the possibility that there were more that they were unrecorded. And it certainly weakens the argument that vineyards were absent from England because of, the, of its climate. Moreover, if it's true that vineyards have been planted in England in Roman times, there is no reason to think that they disappeared between then and the Norman conquest. As I said earlier, the Saxons uh, seem to have uh, held wine in good esteem. Elfric's colloquy, a 7th century Anglo-Saxon text, echoed many classical attitudes when he was saying, wine is not the drink for children or the foolish, but of the older and wiser. Contemporary recipes included wine, and Saxons prepared chicken stewed in wine for invalids, as well as apples and other fruits marinated or stewed in wine. Wine was also among the provisions left for the dead to feast on. The Vikings too also seemed to have positive attitudes towards wine. In the northern Frankings River settlements, they developed permanent commercial interests that offset their better-known hit-and-run economic activities. In addition to consuming much of the produce themselves, they participated in the northern Frankish wine trade, controlling the traffic down the rivers to ports from where the wine was shipped to destinations like England. In the Carolingian Empire, that dominated Western Europe from the late 8th century, wine was the drink of the upper classes and great men boasted of the quality of their wine. Powerful rulers who lived in the Germanic provinces tried to acquire land in the Paris basin and in their own valley, where grapes grew well. All the evidence suggests that if there were negative effects on wine production in that period, following the Roman Empire's, uh, the Western Roman Empire's collapse, 
they were not the result of deliberate policies. Rather, they were the product of the shockwaves felt throughout Europe as the political unity of the empire was replaced by many smaller political units, and as existing patterns of commerce were disrupted. At the very heart of the empire, the city of Rome went into a quite rapid decline, and it's likely that its demand for wine decreased, depriving many wine-producing regions in Italy of a major market. All in all, there were disruptions of the commercial links in the wine production and distribution. Uh, It doesn't mean that um, for that long period of the Middle Ages, 500 years or so, wine production stagnated. Rather, it seemed like it continued to flourish in most areas. And in some localities, like Burgundy, where the forests were cut down to make way for vineyards, land area devoted to viticulture increased, and wines were planted for the first time in parts of Central and Eastern Europe. By the 9th century, with the emergence of the more stable political entity in the form of the Carolingian Empire, security and long-distance trade links were established and the wine industry rebounded. Its recovery was further stimulated by burst population growth from around 1000 AD. The church, through its vineyard-owning bishops and monasteries, played a vital role in both the maintenance and spread of viticulture during these times. Of course, the church had a particular interest in seeing the vineyards flourishing. The clergy required a constant, if modest, supply of wine for communion, and they would best guarantee that the supply by producing the wine themselves. This might simply have been impractical in many cases, for viticulture is a labor-intensive work and many church missions would have lacked the resources to cultivate a vineyard large enough to make wine in viable quantities. Many of the ecclesiastical vineyards that we do know about were very small. They might have produced enough wine for communion and for the clergy's own consumption, but there would have been no surplus for the market. Some religious orders prescribed wine on a daily basis, In Benedictine monasteries, each monk was permitted a daily ration of wine if they could not abstain from wine entirely. This was a pragmatic concession to reality, for Saint Benedict noted that wine is no drink for monks, but since nowadays monks cannot be persuaded of this, let us at least agree upon this, that we drink temperately and not to satiety. In recognition of the medicinal value of wine, A sick monk was to be allowed a graded ration at the discretion of the prior. And this is uh, in contrast with the Roman practice of reducing a sick slave's wine ration because he was not working. The Benedictine rule added that uh, when circumstances did not permit the full ration, or even worse, no wine at all was available, the monks should not complain. Aside of the small vineyards, there were a number of monastic ones which um, were quite uh, big. In 814, the Abbey of Saint-Germain-de-Prés near Paris owned a total of 200,000 hectares of cultivable land, three to 400 hectares of which were planted with vines. These vineyards were not one single estate, but were scattered among scores of small holdings throughout the countryside, none of them too far from the River Seine or Marne. Fewer than half of the vineyards were cultivated directly by the monks themselves, and most were leased to tenants who paid the rent and other tax obligations in wine. The yield of the abbey's vineyards was between 3 and 40 hectoliters of wine per hectare, providing the abbey each year with about 640,000 liters of wine for use at masses, for consumption by the monks, or for sale. Equally significant, the tenants who grew the vines retained almost 700,000 liters for their own use or for sale, a volume that speaks loudly for considerable peasant consumption or the existence of wine market, or more likely, both. The church sponsored the growth of vineyards in several regions that are now in Germany, Austria and Switzerland. The number of wine-producing villages in the area of Fulda, north of Frankfurt, rose from 40 to nearly 400 between the 7th and 9th centuries and vineyards multiplied in the Rhine district and Alsace. One reason for the church's interest in sponsoring and encouraging viticulture by peasants was that the church collected a tithe from all parishioners. In principle, the tithe was a tenth, though in practice it was less, levied on each peasant's annual production, and it was paid in kind, which is obviously the produce on which it was levied, rather than in money. 
quite clearly, a tax paid in barrels of wine was much more easily convertible to cash than a payment in many other kinds of crop. Aside from the wine as a taxation, the church benefited from gifts of wine. In the 6th century, Gregory of Tours cited a pious widow who brought a measure of wine every day to her church. Another example comes to us from the 11th century, just uh, when Robert, Earl of Leicester, gave the Cathedral of Evreux in France three muids of wine, about 800 litres, per year for the celebration of Mass. The wine came from his own vines. Individual bishops owned vineyards in their own right. In the 6th century, Felix, Bishop of Nantes, had vineyards in the nearby Loire region, and other bishops are reported to have been so devoted to the emerging science of viticulture, or perhaps to the consumption of its product, we will never know, that they moved to locations more suitable for grape cultivation. Gregory of Langres, later Saint Gregory, moved to Dijon, where he would be close to the vineyards of Burgundy, and the Bishop of Tongres moved to Liege, while the Bishop of Saint Quentin moved his residence to Noyon on the river Ois, a region considered favourable to grape growing. For his part, Archbishop Siegfried of Mainz was urged by his peasants to let them cultivate cereal on wasteland on a hill near Rudsheim, but he insisted the land should be used only for grape production. One church council, the Council of Aachen, decreed in 816 that every cathedral should have a college of canons who lived under monastic rule, and that the among their obligations was the duty to plant a vineyard. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce, be it wine, herbs, cheeses or olive oil, from all over the wild corners of the country, and working directly with family and artisan producers. Why not? or wine not, try the Ktima Vulvukeli Limnio, a red wine from Avdira, North Greece, the homeland of Democritus. Limnio is a truly ancient and very much praised red wine since antiquity and from no other than Aristotle himself. Deep red, framboise color with red forest fruits in the aroma along with black pepper, cardamom and curry notes spicy texture and long aftertaste. Or if you prefer a white wine, then the special Domaine Sigala's Barrel Sandorini PDO Assyrtico is for you. A barrel fermented Assyrtico which demonstrates the aging qualities of the variety, deep lemon color and a complex nose with citrus fruits and wood notes, round and smooth in the mouth with the acidity being the backbone that allows it to age. The vines are classified as old vines and are over 50 years in age. The rejuvenation of the vineyards employs the same technique from antiquity to the present day. This is truly a unique wine that deserves to be more well known. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art 17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malbian Greek, the one stop shop for your Greek fix. Early medieval Christians rarely took communion, and many even failed to do so the three times a year that religious authorities often suggested was the acceptable minimum. If every parishioner who turned up to communion took a sip from the chalice, the volume required would still be ineligible. So clearly the religious motivations to have vineyards, they are not um, that, um, they don't make sense logistically to us. In terms of practice, of... uh, of communion as well, habits were changing and um, it could have been bread or wine, either bread or wine. And partly, obviously, there were difficulties of transporting and distributing wine to the farthest reach of Christendom. Uh, so sometimes it was only a, the rule only to receive uh, bread in communion. So the priest would drink consecrated wine on behalf of the community. All in all, the church's requirements for wine were minuscule even though wine retained its high status and symbolism in the Christian faith. Clearly, the great bulk of wine used by the church was consumed by the clerics, and of course, in um, a manner and a context that it had uh, very little or nothing at all to do with uh, religion. Bishops and higher-ranking members of religious houses probably drank wine every day, 
and ordinary monks might have done so with when their monastery had a vineyard. Where vineyards were less common and wine was more expensive, monks drank ale and received wine only on special occasions such as feast days. Additionally, many vineyards had no relation to the church at all, being owned by nobles and princes who produced for their own consumption and for the market. Wine was an obligatory offering to distinguished guests, and the banquet without wine was as unthinkable then as it is now. The problem with describing and quantifying the vineyards that were not owned by the church is that many records of land cultivated by secular proprietors have been lost. The records of monasteries have generally survived better because religious orders had a long continuous histories and because monks were not only highly literate, but they valued and conserved their written word. There is evidence that from the 6th century onwards, new vineyards were planted in the western provinces of Germany. Within three centuries, 83 villages in the Palatinate were producing wine, as were 23 in the Baden and 18 in Gutenberg. In some regions, like the Main, Valley and Freising, Viticulture was introduced by Christian missionaries. In some regions, however, factors other than the church influenced the introduction or extension of viticulture. It is possible that the Magyars who invaded northern Hungary at the end of the 9th century had learned to cultivate vines and make wine from their contact with Caucasus. On the other hand, the Eastern Roman Empire was not um, subjected to the same problems as the West. Agriculture there was and viticulture included in that, uh, very important and prospered, while the West was in a political and economical turmoil. Greece and its islands continued to be prominent wine producers, and from the 4th century, Greece and Turkey began to produce a sweet wine from Muscat grapes. Back then it was known as Romania wine in Northern Europe because of its origins in the Roman Empire. With the development of monasticism in the Holy Land, vineyards were established in areas of Negev in the south of present-day Israel. Wine, along with bread, was a staple of the region's diet. Penances often included mandatory abstinence from wine, which would have been a real hardship, one that deprived the penitent not uh, so much of an enjoyable beverage as of basic food. The wines of the Aegean Sea, so often prized by ancient Greeks, ancient Greek connoisseurs, continued to be prominent in this period. Classified by Byzantine writers according to their color, white, yellow, red or black, their body, thick or thin, and by taste, they comprised a wide range of styles that were consumed by themselves and also used for cooking and medicinal purposes. One additional use for wine, a military one, also emerged. Linen fabric soaked in wine and salt and then dried developed a hardness that enabled it to be used as a replacement for armor. Now soldiers could use wine both inside and out to fortify themselves for the battle. It seems that the Carolingian period was undoubtedly beneficial to one of France's wine regions in particular, Champagne. Many of the region's great abbeys, including that of Epernay, were founded in the 7th century and vineyards were soon planted on their domains. Within two centuries, the vines of Champagne were extensive enough for distinctions to be made between specific districts. What undoubtedly gave Champagne's wines a boost was the coronation of Charlemagne's son, Louis, in Reims in 816. As Reims became the traditional place for the coronation of French kings, the wines of Champagne gained an aura of royalty, an image intensified much later when Champagne came to refer to the distinctive sparkling wine made in the region. Although Carolingians adopted policies that promoted viticulture and wine production, Charlemagne himself is reported to have been a moderate drinker. He rarely drank more than three cups of wine with dinner, and he prescribed harsh penalties for drunkenness. Of course, with religious uh, reasons to abstain or drink moderately, or with uh, decrees from kings specifying that people should uh, abstain from drunkenness, it doesn't mean that bouts of heavy drinking were uncommon. Far from it. There's historical record that suggests drunkenness was a cultural trait, if um, documentary evidence is any guide, then the Anglo-Saxon inhabitants of England were the worst offenders of all. There are more references to intoxication there than to the rest of Europe combined. Yet, there's no reason to think that populations of continental Europe drank notably less. As far as the Merovingian Gaul is concerned, 
There are many records of public drunkenness that depict drinkers stumbling through the streets, vomiting, and when they retained enough physical control and coordination, engaging in acts of violence. Drinking cups, many with traces of ale or wine, have been recovered from graves throughout France and southern Germany, indicative of a culture of drinking. Some of the cups bear inscriptions such as I'm thirsty, fill it up, pos, pour it, and rejoice, I'm full of joy. Of course, at the same period, we had uh, the Muslim conquest of uh, Middle East and North Africa and um, reaching all the way to Spain as well, which uh, would have led to considerable reduction of consumption of wine. But um, obviously, in such a diverse ethnically regions and um, also with conquered regions by Muslims who had predominantly Christian populations, wine drinking was always in the cards. The attitude of uh, the rulers, the Muslim rulers, was increasingly tolerant toward the local traditions. In Spain, Portugal, Sicily, Sardinia and Crete, for example, a number of policies coexisted. Some Muslim rulers made wine production legal, but in practice permitted it to continue and went so far as to give recognition by taxing it. Arabic sources suggest that vineyards were widespread in southern Spain, especially Andalusia, and in the region of Coimbra in Portugal. Islamic horticulture was so advanced that the number of varieties of grapes increased, and some Muslim texts on agriculture included instructions on taking care of fermentation vats. In Spain, an intriguing interpretation by Muslim legal commentators of the prohibition of alcohol allowed it to be drunk there. It was argued that the beverage referred to in the Quran was wine made from grapes and that wine made from dates was thereby excluded from prohibition. But the argument went, if date wine was allowed, so was grape wine, as long as it was no more intoxicating than date wine. Such reasoning was not universally accepted, of course, by Muslim scholars. It failed to answer the objection that even if drinking did not lead to drunkenness and immorality, it certainly distracted the pious from thinking about God. Although there was a debate among Muslim jurists about the meaning of wine and its prohibition, there was universal agreement that drunkenness was forbidden. The possibility of drinking appears to have been embraced enthusiastically by Muslims in Spain, although it thought that wine consumption was lower among them than among Christians. Muslims drank at occasions reminiscent of Greek symposia. Men would gather around after the evening meal and drink wine, diluted with water, while relaxing on cushions. Wine was poured by serving boys, and the participants talked, recited poetry, and were entertained by female singers and dancers. They were expected to spend the night drinking, talking, and dozing, then waking and drinking again. The same sort of wine-drinking occasions were common among Jews in Muslim Spain, and they gave rise to a particular genre of poetry that flourished between the 10th and 12th centuries. Some of this poetry celebrated the ability of wine to banish cares and bring joy to the drinker. Other poems celebrated wine itself and commented in its appearance, age and aroma. Even at the heart of the Islamic empire, however, it is likely that wine was still produced. The Muslim prohibition was on wine, not on grapes, and vineyards were still extensively cultivated to provide fruit to be eaten fresh or dried. Although vineyards for wine production might well have been ripped up, it was possible to make a poor, perhaps rather sweet and certainly a stable wine from table grapes, and wine was produced here and there in defiance of the law. The rule of abstinence created some cultural problems. Wine has been an important theme in classical Arabic poetry, where it was associated with love and sex. Wine persisted as a theme even after the coming of Islam, but literally strategies were employed to accommodate the new faith. One early 9th century poet, Abu Nuwas seemed to defy the rule in some of his works. You made me fear God, your Lord. If you will not drink with me for fear of punishment, then I will drink alone. Later, a group of 12th and 13th century Persian poets made wine and love prominent themes. In one of these, which is a long work in praise of wine, includes sentiments such as I cannot live without the sparkling vintage cannot bear the body's burden without wine. And more to the point, this poem implied that illegal drinking and relationships were common. 
They say lovers and drunkards go to hell. A controversial dictum not easy to accept. If the lover and drunkard are for hell, tomorrow paradise will be empty. It is possible but unlikely that wine remained no more than a cultural memory that was invoked in these poems. It is more likely that wine and other alcohol, such as date and raisin wine, were illicitly produced and consumed, although the surviving culture of wine drinking must have been a pale shadow of the pre-Islamic times. While it is difficult to know the exact effect of Islam on wine, we can be certain that viticulture was geared for table grapes, that what wine was produced was inferior and made in dramatically smaller quantities, and the culture of wine, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, almost disappeared. These early ages of Christendom in Europe, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, what we call Middle Ages, were uh, very perilous years for wine. Wine was exposed in a number of threats. But nothing really seemed to eradicate wine production. The upheavals of the period might well have been disrupted production and trade, but at least in Europe, wine remained a culturally important and well-placed for the recession of the late Middle Ages. And that's it. Thank you for listening. That was part five of History of Wine. Uh, wine in Europe in the Middle Ages. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Remember, if you want the podcasts early and ad-free, please subscribe on Patreon, where you get also articles, essays and recipes extra for free. And on top, for every new patron, uh, there is a wealth of past articles and podcasts and extra material to explore. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.